The thoughts and opinions expressed on Halal Money Matters do not necessarily reflect the views of Saturna Capital, Amana Mutual Funds, or their affiliates. Welcome to Halal Money Matters, brought to you by Saturna Capital. I'm Munim Salam. And my co-host, Scott Sinclair, is actually on vacation, so I thought I'd do this episode on my own. We have with us Haytham Al Sayed. So Haytham has been with uh, Saturna Capital for six years. I initially started off in the community sales group. I used to go around the country and, and talk to different Muslim communities and talk to clients, uh, the managed shareholders, those type of things. And then recently has joined the investment advisory services group and is running wealth management for Saturna Capital. And this leads us into the topic that we have today, which is on financial planning, which is something also Haytham has a lot of experience with. So uh, Haytham, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your background in financial planning, because I know sure. you've done that for, for, for quite a while now. Sure. So back in my, I'm not going to give my age, but back in the day when I was uh, building my book of business at a large uh, banking institution, global institution, I was exposed to the financial planning world and the tools available and resources. and you know, when you first try something new, you're always hesitant about the outcome. But over time and over experience and good mentoring and coaching, I got to be comfortable with the tools and the resources. And it allowed me to ask, you know, some really in-depth questions with clients and prospects to understand their financial picture, what their goals are, and put it together. And with that, uh, I feel like it's a necessary tool. A lot of people think they don't need it because it's only for the rich or high net worth, but in fact, we all need it and it's never too late. So it's a great thing to, to have and be able to take advantage of. So let's talk a little bit about need um, because you ask my parents or my grandparents say, did you have a financial plan? They said, yes, my kids, right? Yes. Um, my kids were the ones who were going to be paying for my retirement and or you know they had land and that's all they needed. Why do you think it's important specifically in the Muslim community for financial plans? You mentioned about parents leaning on their kids. It's called the Sanders generation, where they have to take care of their parents, but also take care of their kids. Uh, there's a quote, uh, I'm trying to remember, if you plan to fail, you fail to plan. And nobody plans to fail, they fail to plan. Correct. And so it's, it's important to kind of do your homework. And as you do your homework and you understand the material, you have a better sense. It's never going to be exact. It's never going to be perfect. But without a plan, you're just kind of going at it like, inshallah. But there are things that we could take advantage of just to have a good picture. It's a high level, 40,000 level view, as I call it, of what the future might look like and what we can do now to make things a little bit more comfortable later. And there's conversations that you're going to have with family about what's going to happen and the what ifs. And these are difficult conversations. They're uncomfortable conversations, but it's to make things comfortable later. On any situation. So, for example... It doesn't have to be your retirement. It could be education um, planning. Education planning. How do you take care of your parents? Correct. Healthcare. What social security is going to look like? I mean, a lot of people don't even go to ssa.gov just to see what their estimated benefit is. Yeah, so, I'll be honest. I've never been there either. Yeah. So highly suggest doing that. There's strategies with how you take out social security when you retire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. That kind of sets up the idea of maybe why it's important. But I'm sure there's a lot of work involved in creating the plan. On my side, if I'm doing the plan because I might not have all my finances all detailed out everywhere in, in one specific spreadsheet, sure. that type of thing. Sure. So what does it take? Well, it takes data and good data because the better data input, the better output someone can provide. Working with an advisor or professional certified financial planner is going to give you that confidence and credibility that you know the person has put their time to pass an extensive test and examination, but also understands the material. Because there's different parts of the financial plan. It's just not like retirement, like you mentioned. There's retirement, there's education, there's healthcare, there's social security. I mean, you could focus more on the Islamic wills, trust, asset protection. So it encompasses the whole gamut. And it takes time in the front to do it right the first time, to gather all this information, to have these conversations. But once it's in the system, once it's in a plan, then all it needs is updates, either annually or life changes events, it's all in the system. And we just look at, well, this changed, so what's gonna happen? Are we on track or not? But you can do it online too, right? There is plenty of tools. They're kind of in silos. You'll have like a retirement calculator. You might have like a will, but you just have to understand the background of these and how they're composed because not everything out there is, you know, accurate or Mm -hmm. sourced correctly. So it's good to have kind of like a, you know, when you go to a doctor, get a second opinion. They do ask you, things that are so far in the future that sometimes you're like, I have no idea 
for example, I'm so young right now, in, in my 20s right now, and uh, I'm thinking about saying I'm going to retire at 60. Well, are you going to need a new car then? I don't know if I'm going to need a new car. I don't even know if I'll be alive 40 years from now. So how do you think about these issues? I tell clients, you know, what is your lifestyle you're accustomed to right now? And with inflation and today's dollar is not the, the same as tomorrow's dollar, it's the same gallon of gas, but it's just going to cost you more in 20 years, right? So we work the numbers backwards, and that's what the planning tool allows is to look at the numbers backwards and say, okay, if we want to maintain this lifestyle, what do we need to have now, what we're saving, what we're putting in to be able to be at least close right mm -hmm. i personally like to take a more conservative approach with my clients when i do these plans what i mean by conservative is like i like to have a buffer zone if the return on the portfolio is estimated at a certain percentage i might put it down to a percentage just to be sure that there's that cushion if, if that makes sense if i'm thinking about retirement is there any rules of thumbs i should keep in mind but just as napkin calculations like what should i be thinking about Obviously, there's a couple rules of thumb. Number one is if you currently have a 401k through your employer, you want to try to maximize or at least do the match. So doing that and having a habitual disciplined process to make sure that you're putting money in every time, whether it's a 401k, if you don't have 401k, you know, even an IRA or any of these qualified types of accounts that has tax advantages. That's number one. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I took a class on home economics. And back then they used to teach you how to write checks. Like, Here's a blank check, yeah. you know, how do you write it? Yes. It was really yes. funny, but one of the things that the teacher told me, and I still remember it to this day, is that she said every month when you're sitting down and doing all your bills, and before you start doing your bills, pay yourself first. But I still remember that philosophy, pay yourself first. I know some people are, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. Some people are, you know, mashallah blessed and what have you. But everybody can do something. When you say, I'm going to contribute, you know, 3% of my salary, Try next month to do five. Is that going to affect your life that much? Most likely, maybe not. I always tell clients to challenge themselves to up it a little bit, right? And again, that's remember, it's, it's just an automatic savings coming out of your debit or checking account going into a retirement account for the long term. It's like paying yourself an annuity. Okay. The other thing that I'm a big believer in, like a lot of us get either annual bonuses or maybe even an annual salary bump, right? So if you're comfortable with the lifestyle you're at, take that bump in salary and just put it away Correct. or take the bonus that you have and put that away whatever you do earlier the better earlier the better it's never too late to start and what but, do you think about inflation like how much should be yeah it should be there yeah. well inflation. if you talk about last year or this year uh, it's quite high yeah. so it's uh, it's hitting everybody hard right in all levels if it's not at least getting nine percent you're losing money to inflation mm -hmm. and if you think about college college was uh, as high as six seven percent every year growth of their expenses so you have to have your money grow at some type of vehicle. You talked a little bit about savings and investing and, and how much we should be doing, which is the minimum you said would be uh, whatever the company is matching you. But what if the company doesn't match? Is there a good rule of thumb for how much yeah, you should I mean, save? usually the, the consensus on the street is about 10% uh, savings from your income. Is kind of like for savings for retirement. Now, obviously, this is after you have something for emergency funds. So mm -hmm. the number, number one thing is to keep aside for cash for emergency, God forbid, at least six months to probably uh, 12 months. I've also had a conversation with clients where maybe that figure is too big. So you don't need that much money sitting in the bank. Maybe do half of it and the rest do with something conservative, but it's still an emergency fund. And then whatever extra in that 10% range could be saved up is probably a good good place to think. About. And then when you're thinking about it, there's savings, which you can put into a bank and there's investing, which you can put into the market. But there's other things you can do as well, right? What about like your own house or? Correct. Uh, I just had a conversation yesterday with a prospect who has, you know, several rental properties and they're not putting as much in the 401k. So we had the conversation. Well, yeah, it's part of your retirement plan. If you're planning to keep it and get rental income, that's a good thing. You just have to, you know, uh, study it well and see what type of return versus how much you're putting into the house, the taxes, the maintenance, the HOAs versus putting in the market. It's not apples to apples, but you have to just weigh it. But as a strategy, it's a different asset class. So, yeah, that could be something to think about. Okay. A lot of people ask this question is everybody wants to know what's that magic number, right? The magic number means what is that number that I, if I have this much money, yeah. I'm going to you know, reduce my hours of work, I'm going to go part-time, I'll retire, do all of those things. Is there an easy way to calculate that or is it more complicated? There's no one number because everyone's different, obviously. Uh, the way I look at it and I tell clients to look at it is, okay, 
if this is in your stage of life, what you're accustomed to and you like this lifestyle, work the number backwards. Meaning, if your yearly expenses, let's say, for example, is 100000 okay? Well, in order to have 100000 coming in, I look at the gap. Where's the gap? So if we look at our Social Security, obviously the average check is, what, 1500 1600 So it's not much. But if you look at your estimated benefit and obviously take it a little bit down to make it more conservative, and you say, okay, I need 5000 a month or 8000 a month to get me that number I need yearly, Minus my Social Security. And remember, you have to pay taxes, Social Security, or the income taxes. So minus that percentage. And by the way, if you're from a state that has income tax, right, you get state tax and you get federal tax. Yeah. So it's not actually, you know, 2500 is going to yeah. be less. Yeah. So where's that gap? From 2500 I need, you know, 8000 a month to maintain the lifestyle. Well, where's that going to come from? Then you go and say, okay, what am I putting in investments and how much is that going to grow and using a financial plan or a tool? Let's say you have, at the end of the day, a million dollars being invested on an average 10% return before taxes, you're looking at 100,000 of growth, right? So, and you minus 20% for capital gains or what have you, if it's in a taxable account or if it's in a retirement, there's ordinary income tax. Anyway, I'm not a tax advisor, but... You know, consult your tax advisor. What, what I'm trying to say is you can work the numbers backwards and say, this is my end goal. What do I need to invest? What's coming in? Mm -hmm. And then put it together. So, you know, I like to use a 5% rule mm -hmm. on a net basis. Yep. That will take into account your capital gains taxes, maybe right. even zakat even, right. you know, for, for that matter. Yeah, that's a good and number. And so five, the 5%. So if at that 100,000 level, you're working yourself back at 5%, that becomes 2 million. Right. So then your magic number is, quote unquote is two million. two million that all automatically kind of adjusts for inflation along the way because whenever you calculate it you just calculate a five percent and then you'll be able to do that so that's typically you know what what, what is a good way to kind of say you know ballpark it but it's, you know obviously you need more than the ballpark uh, to, to do it and again things change in your life and so uh, one of the things that people think about is it's not one and done mm -hmm. right you really do have to Keep up with it and yeah. just like an annual year. checkup with a doctor. Like, you know, yeah. if you imagine you don't go to a doctor for five years, uh, things come up, right? And you might not know it's happening in your body, but if you have the exam or the blood test, it'll tell you. Same thing with the financial plan, just mm -hmm. have it reviewed. Yeah. In your experience, do people have all of this information consolidated to be able to come up with the plan? No, because majority of the time, everyone's focusing on their career and their family. So they, you know, they worked at one company, they built the 401k, they left. It's either there or they rolled it over. They have another mm -hmm. account they opened. So, but eventually you want to kind of think about for peace of mind, having it all in one place to manage it. If you are in a traditional or pre-tax type of account, you're going to have required minimum distributions that you have to take out every year so that number for a required minimum distribution is what 73 so think about it it's your responsibility as an investor to take out money from all these places and if you don't you could be penalized up to 50 percent of that yep. one of my biggest clients in my previous uh, firms was just asked can i see your beneficiaries and it had uh, ex-spouse and i'm like hey you know if something happens and so he's like, I didn't know, I didn't realize. And he decided to move all his relationships just because of that. Yeah. And so, yes, you might have had a spouse, you might have had a charity, a trust that needed, had changed. So the beneficiary form is very important. The beneficiary form trumps all these trusts and documents. So that's really important to have that updated and actually to reach out to estate planning attorneys if you need to incorporate it with your trust. A lot of people have multiple different accounts, multiple places. One spouse or another doesn't know where they are or, or what they have or like an inventory of assets. Not I only think. that, uh, they could have two mutual funds. One is buying Microsoft, one is selling Microsoft. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it just you just have to take a deeper dive of what's, what's out there. So the financial plan gives you one source of all your inventory Correct. as well. And it does, it, lack of better words, a deconstruction of your portfolio. Plus it puts your portfolio in a stress test. So what it does, it does a Monte Carlo simulation, which means it runs it through a thousand trials of up markets, down markets, high interest rates, low interest rates, geopolitical, everything, and says, what is the probability of this portfolio surviving these type of conditions? Mm -hmm. And I've done this for so many years and so many different high net worth client levels and people just starting out. And what I found out, it's not really the return on the investments, that biggest impact, that there is some, some of that in there that factor but it's mostly about what age you want to retire and how much you're going to spend in retirement or mm -hmm. you like to spend 
And if you play with those two factors, there's a huge impact on the results of success. So it's not even a contribution? Uh, not as much. It's still a player, but not as much as those two. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We were talking about rules of thumb. In your experience, what are some common mistakes that you've seen people make while they're in their accumulation phase? One is lack of education. So number one, I always tell people to study it and understand it. And, understand what? And understand the concept of investing early. If they're comfortable managing themselves, great. But if they're not professionals in it, you know, seek out, you know, professional help. Number two, I know these days that people are allowed to take money out of their 401k or their IRA. And obviously, there's some penalties and some conditions for penalties. Sometimes it's a necessity. The goal of the account is for retirement. So you're not supposed to touch it until after 59 and a half. You know, there are some unintended consequences by taking money out from these type of accounts. The other thing to avoid is not thinking long term. They invest in something and they see their value go down. Like, let's say last year, if someone started last year, the market went down. So they have this fear and they pull money out. And then when the market goes back up, they want to go back in. And so they sold low, bought high. And a retirement should be a long term investment specifically. Any investment should be long term. And that's how they should keep that mindset. When you're younger and you're saving for investing for anything, you tend to be much more aggressive with it, right? You're going to buy the thing that your best friend told you about, whether it be a meme stock or something along those lines. They aren't the right decisions to make. And partly it's because you're young and you want to be risky. And part of it is because the money is very small to be able to mess with. But at the same time, as you're getting closer to retirement, people start making the mistake of, again, micromanaging. Either they go too aggressive or too conservative, yeah. but really kind of people have to think about is maybe just like set it and forget it. And I think you have this emotion tied to it. When you have that emotion and that fear of fight, they call it, that's when you can ruin the plan of your long-term projection. The one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, when our grandfathers were alive, the average lifespan was 10 years in retirement. But because we're living 10, 20, 30 years in retirement now, is that we cannot keep that thinking that only be conservative towards retirement. You have to think of longevity and you have to think of different buckets and how to manage these different buckets for the different time periods in mm -hmm. retirement. So let's talk a little bit about the accumulation phase and maybe some different stages, right? So let's suppose I just graduated from college and I'm just starting off. Okay. Give me three pieces of advice. Well, I'll tell you my story. When I started, I wasn't married. Um, luckily, I told you I had this mentor at work to start early and I said, okay, I'll just put the maximum. So I put the maximum. For a couple of years, I got married, I cut it in half, that contribution. For a couple of years, I had kids, I cut it in half. But because obviously I had duties and expenses, that 25 out of college or in that age period is try to maximize as much as possible. There's always going to be things that you want to buy. There's a difference between want and need. Look at your budget. This is very important. Look at your budget. Make sure you have your needs covered whether it's rent or house or whatever it is, gas, medical, food, then look at your emergency and then whatever is left, maximize all that into some saving vehicle. Okay. So as a youngster, I have to think about marriage. I have to think about kids. I have to think about my parents and then maybe retirement. So put a bucket of a regular taxable savings account, investment account for those things, for down payment, uh, buying a car, what have you, but still have that bucket for retirement. As we're talking about the accumulation phase and, and 20, 25 years old, sometimes I do get the question, you know, should I be investing in a tax deferred account or like a Roth account? Is there a formula or kind of rule of thumb that... There's no specific rule of thumb, but if you think about it just for hypothetical numbers, if you're putting it in a traditional IRA right now and taking the deductions, that benefit may look good today. And you say, oh, I'm going to deduction on my income, right? But over time and the growth of over time being tax deferred versus putting in a Roth because that traditional, you might be paying up to like 30% in taxes when you retire. So if you're right now 30% and below tax bracket, it may be worth to put it in Roth now and not take the deduction. Again, based on time value of money and compounding growth over time, all that growth is tax deferred. And when you take it out, it's tax free. Mm -hmm. So it's just the cost benefit you have to think about. And you can also do it not only in the Roth IRA, but a lot of companies offer Roth 401ks. Okay, so you can still take the deduction yeah. off your salary yeah. 
Yeah. You just have to pay taxes on it, but it might be beneficial, beneficial. Yeah. because of that delta between lower tax versus so, higher tax um, later on. Uh, okay, so I'm now st starting saving for different buckets. Right now I'm married and we're just about to put a down payment on a house. But I see I have some money saved in my 401k. Yeah. And you are allowed to take money out of your 401k, whether you take it out or you borrow money from your 401k to do that. So a lot of people, what they do when they want to be able to put a down payment on a house, mm -hmm. a lot of companies will offer you a loan from your 401k Correct. and then you're paying yourself back. Correct. You can have a debate on whether that's good or not. Some people might say it's good. Some people might say it's bad. Sure. What ends up happening is you're not able to use that money for growth. You're only able to use that money to pay back whatever you invested in. Mm -hmm. So I think unless you're living in a very expensive area, you're probably better off trying to save separately for your housing and that type of thing rather than borrowing it or taking it out of your four. Okay, would you agree with that? Yeah, and remember the the goal of the account 401k is for retirement. I know they allow you to do things like that, but the goal is to always remember it's for retirement. You could have another bucket that you're saving Correct. for, yeah. like in the Roth, and, Roth IRA. Yeah, so if you're putting, let's say, 10%, the match is five, right? You might down it to seven and put that 3% to that down payment. You're still putting 10, sure. but it's different buckets. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about the bonuses and stuff. I mean, those are all great vehicles to uh, put octane to the gas, if you will. So now my kids are getting older and I'm realizing that most likely that they're not going to get need-based scholarships. And alhamdulillah, we're making enough money to be able to support them in college. I did save a little bit of college. And, and again, I get this temptation. Now my 401k balance is even bigger than it was when I was 25 and getting married. What about college? Do you think it's a good idea to take money out of your 401k to pay for college? No. Again, uh, going to the definition and the goal of the 401k, it, you have to tie the goal to the account. I mean, I can say, okay, is it right that I have this liquid checking account in the bank? It's for emergency fund, let's say. I'm just going to go use it to buy a nice TV because mm -hmm. the Super Bowl is coming. It's tempting, right? You see the money, you're like, hey, like, let's do it. Now you're getting closer to like the idea that when you turn about 55 or so, 50 to 55, you know, most likely for, for an average person, their kids have now graduated from college. They are now earning themselves. So you have a lot more discretionary income, yep. right? So, I mean, that is an opportunity for you to really bulk up your investing sure. for retirement, those type of things as sure, well. Sure, because the rule of thumb is about that you're going to need 70 to 80% of your current income in retirement. Why? Because hopefully the houses are paid, kids are done with school. Do I need to be making adjustments to my investments as far as asset allocation, those type of things? It's always good to have it reviewed, but you know, not necessarily because the plan is to stick to the plan for the long term. Mm. So if this bucket of money was for to get you through retirement at the last 10 years of retirement, then you should stick to it and not shift it too much. You know? Okay. But now I'm about to retire. One of the questions that I always get is, at what age should I take my social security? Mm. So you don't have to answer specifically, yeah, yeah. but what are some general rules of calc uh, yeah. uh, that I should uh, be thinking well, about? Yeah, you know, it's a funny, interesting concept when I talk to clients about this because the full retirement age is 67, but you could delay your social security up to age 70. The on rough estimate, that's about a 10,000 difference in estimated benefit per, per year, per year, per couple uh, each, right? It really depends on your circumstances, situation. If, you know, Allah has blessed you and you have the means, then maybe there is a strategy to delay it. Mm. But if you are, you know, in need of it, then taking it at full retirement age or maybe even before full retirement age to cover expenses and needs, then that's something you'd want to think about as okay. well. The second thing to consider would be the, your asset allocation at the point of retirement. Mm. Like, you know, you're just maybe a year or six months away. Right. Um, should I be making any adjustments? It definitely should be reviewed, not necessarily major adjustments. There might be some fine tuning because you have a core allocation for the goal. Then there might be some tactical allocation that you have to shift a little bit here and there just because things have changed in your life or income or what have you or expenses. And one of the things that a lot of people miss in expenses during retirement, they don't think about is healthcare costs. So there's Medicare, all that stuff, but there's still costs for that. That's one of the biggest costs is healthcare. Hopefully we never need it or use it. It's all about planning. So it's all thinking about, you know, do I have this? Take advantage of it if I have it. If I don't, then think about the future, how I'm going to pay for healthcare, mm -hmm. right? No one's expecting to get sick and yeah. have huge bills. But one of the biggest mistakes people will make at the point of retirement because they need the income, mm -hmm. they will become too conservative in their asset allocation. Correct because they don't realize that they might be using the money for 25, 30 years. And then also long-term care, like in our community, we think about, okay, our 
kid's going to take care of us or someone. Well, if the kid is a doctor or he, they're busy and they can't have time to take care, who is going to take care? And if you, you need that, there's planning for long-term care as well. I mean, there's all these avenues to think about within the healthcare. You know, one of the things I think about for long-term care and relying on my kids is that for a lot of us that are older, uh, not me, of course, yes, yes. But, <laughs> but a lot of us that are older, you know, we left our parents in our home countries and we came here. Correct. Who's taking care of them? We're not. So why are we expecting our kids to take care of us when we couldn't even take care of our own parents? Maybe they will. But if they don't, don't get upset because you didn't do it for your parents. You know, that type of thing is really important um, to kind of think about also. Okay, so now I was early in making a financial plan. So I have all of these vehicles that I've yeah. saved or, or invested in, yeah. whether it be my Roth or IRA or my spouse. I have 401k, all of these different things. So now that I'm in retirement, yeah. is there a rule of thumb that talks about like where I should draw from first? Yeah, yeah. when you start retirement, technically your income drops and so your tax bracket drops, right? So the rule of thumb is you start taking from your taxable accounts, your brokerage accounts, your investment accounts. Because when you sell, you're going to have a lower capital gains on it. Second, you take it from your tax deferred or pre-tax. Those are your traditional IRAs, traditional 401k contributions. Again, when you take money out because you got a deduction when you put it in, it grew tax deferred. Now you have to pay ordinary income taxes on it, but it'll be at a lower bracket depending on how much you take out. The last bucket you want to use is your tax free. So your Roth contributions or your Roth IRA, Roth 401k. Having said that, there are also strategies. I've talked to clients where they really don't need the income from their IRAs or the money in the IRAs and their goal is to give it to their kids or to charities. Mm -hmm. And there's a window early in stages of retirement, typically, where you could actually convert some of this balances, depending on how much. And you don't have to do it all at once because remember, you have to pay conversion uh, tax. And instead of doing it one lump sum, you can break it down five, six years, depending on that window. And, you know, again, consult CPA tax advisor. But instead of, let's say there's 300,000 you want to give from the traditional IRA. Well, if you keep it in traditional IRA, the beneficiaries, whether it's kids or charity, charities not going to pay taxes, but the kids are going to have not the 300,000, they're going to have 300,000 minus taxes. So it's going to be, you know, let's say 250. Versus if you take the 300,000, pay the taxes on it now, you're going to have a lower tax bracket on the conversion. It will grow over time. At least they're going to have more and it's going to be tax free. And there's no RMD or requirement of distribution on the Roth. On, so can on the Roth, there is not. Correct. Yes. Yes. Once you've converted it, you can right. last longer for, right. for you as well. Now, you've gone into the retirement phase and you're doing that. We talked about this idea of RMD, requirement of distribution. Right. But some people, they work past the 70s or 72 or 73. Do you still have to take money out even though you're working in that type of thing? Yeah. If you have any traditional or pre-tax type of account, you are required to take out. It's a formula. It, there's a there's a federal rate that's calculated. Most institutions will calculate it for you and let you know what that RMD is and amount. And that has to be taken out. Now, you have a choice, obviously, that if you don't need it, you can do a couple of things. You can gift it, charity, you can reinvest it for future needs. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with that. Yeah. You know, one thing you, you reminded me of as far as taking money out and the taxes is concerned, people tell me how much their balance in their 401k or their IRAs. I always tell them to, to minus that by 30% mm -hmm. because that's, that's the tax. That's always something to keep in the back of your mind is that what you see is not what you have. Correct. It's always a little bit less than that. Yeah. Probably. In the early stages for the younger folks, I'm going to pay 30% taxes on any traditional later in life. Well, if you're below 30% tax bracket now, it's probably better not to take the deduction if you would do it in a traditional IRA or 401k. All right. Thank you very much for, for your time. But is there any final thoughts you want to leave us with as we're closing? Yeah. I mean, even doing this interview and having done this for so many clients, it's always like, well, what did I miss in my plan? Like always there's something like, did I capture everything? And you have to really make it a priority, just like you have your doctor, you have your mechanic. You should have an investment professional as your center of influence and guidance and mentor to help you through this. It's a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. All right. Take care. Please consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing.
To obtain this and other important information about the Amana Funds in a current prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-800-728-8762. Please read the prospectus or summary prospectus carefully before investing. The Amana Funds are distributed by Saturna Brokerage Services, member FINRA and SIPC, and a wholly owned subsidiary of Saturna Capital, the investment advisor to the Amana Funds. Investing involves risk, including the risk that you could lose money. The Amana Funds restrict investments to those companies consistent with Islamic and sustainable principles, which limits opportunities and may affect performance. This material is for general information only and is not a research report or commentary on any investment products offered by Saturna Capital. This material should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security in any jurisdiction where such an offer or solicitation would be illegal. We do not provide tax accounting or legal advice to our clients, and all investors are advised to consult with their tax accounting or legal advisors regarding any potential investment. Investors should not assume that investments in the securities and or sectors described were or will be profitable. This podcast is prepared based on information Saturna Capital deems reliable. However, Saturna Capital does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information. Investors should consult with a financial advisor prior to making an investment decision. The views and information discussed in this commentary are at a specific point in time, are subject to change, and may not reflect the views of the firm as a whole. All material presented in this publication, unless specifically indicated otherwise, is under copyright to Saturna. No part of this publication may be altered in any way copied or distributed without the prior express written permission of Saturna Capital.